And today we are closing out a series that we began now five weeks ago called Getting the Gospel Right. But I wanted to let you know where we'll be going from here next Sunday. I will not be in this pulpit, but Pastor Stephen will, and you will be hearing from him as he brings the Word of God to you. Then the week, that'll be on the 10th. Then the week after that, on the 17th, we begin a new series, a six-week series, What God Can Do Through Ordinary You. Next week, you'll have an invitation for this series in the bulletin. And you know, folks, sometimes we think, you know what, I, I can't serve God because I'm not smart enough, or I'm not talented enough, or I don't have the giftedness that somebody else has. Boy, look at how naturally they do that. I could never do that. I don't have time. I don't have resources. So many different things that we say. But folks, God wants to do God doesn't need you to do anything for him. He wants to do something amazing through you. And that's what we're going to see during the course of this series. So I want to encourage you to join us for every week of that series, What God Can Do Through Ordinary You. What if I decided to just not show up today? What if the alarm went off and I said, oh man, that's early. I'm not getting up. And I turned the alarm off and I rolled over and I went back to sleep. There would be a vacancy up here and you would know about it right about now. What if the person who led you to faith in Jesus Christ thought they had something more important to do that day. What if our missionaries sharing on fields that are both in North America and also all across the globe, what if they said, you know what, I think today we'll just go to some neat places and do some sightseeing and we don't really need to be a part of what God is doing in the international body of Christ. We have a tendency to get into some comfort zones. Comfort zones can actually be deadly. I remember reading about a man who was in the last stages of hypothermia when he was rescued. He was actually caught out in a blizzard and didn't have time to get back to uh, where his car was. He was on a hike, and a blizzard had stranded him. And during the course of that time, he began to get hypothermia very rapidly because he was not uh, dressed for the climate that he was in. And right when he was rescued, they said if they had gotten there, an hour later, he would have been dead. And he tells the story of hypothermia. He says, everybody assumes that your body freezing would be a very painful experience. But the longer you go in hypothermia, you get more and more comfortable. And your body just wants to go to sleep. I hope God will use these five messages to move you beyond your personal comfort zone. Remember, we talked about finding your one person. Everybody look on the back of your notes page right now. Our I-4 strategy, we are investing in the lives of other people. You're seeking to enter the world of somebody else, just like Jesus did when he came to this planet. Then you invite them. Use a church invitation. We've got a bunch of these out there. A general church invitation that just says, hey, would you like to come to church with me, invite them to one of our worship services, sit with them, talk with them after the service, then include them, ask them to be a part of your Sunday school class, your Bible fellowship, invite them to a class get together maybe, and then inquire as your relationship deepens with that person, ask them if they understand what it takes for a person to go to heaven, and then be ready and willing to share with them what it takes. And I hope God will use these messages to move us beyond our personal comfort zones. We all have personal comfort zones. Some people have comfort zones in their social circles. There are people they will associate with and they won't associate with, maybe based on the class of person they are. Other people have political comfort zones. 
don't have much to do with people who don't share their own personal political persuasions. And our country perpetuates that with red state, blue state kind of mentality. Some of us even have comfort zones in church. Maybe you have a comfort zone that's close enough for you to see and hear and far enough back that you don't get spit on. That's kind of a comfort zone. Whether it's the place that we sit, whether it's the circle of our friends with whom we associate, the type of conversations that we employ when we talk with people, the worship expressions that we feel comfortable with, it is easy to get comfortable. And when we get comfortable, sometimes we will miss the great things that God has in store for us. Most Christians, it seems like today, want to just settle for a good life. We want to have a good church with good programs and good worship and good friendships when we have a great commission and a great purpose in it. God's calling us to move beyond these walls. When we study the life of Jesus, he was constantly moving men and women out of their comfort zones. He called Peter, James, and John from their fishing boat and from their fishing nets, and it says they left everything and followed him. He called them to leave the comfort zone of their surroundings. He called Matthew, the tax collector, to leave his social comfort zones. You know, it's interesting. You look at a guy like Matthew, and tax collectors were seen as outcasts in those days. But even in the fraternity of outcasts, there's something of a social circle. And Matthew had to leave that and cross a barrier to do that. He called Zacchaeus to leave his economic status. He called the woman at the well to overcome not just the bad relationship she was in right then, but a series of bad relationships. Comfort zones keep us from our potential. In the business world, businessmen can gravitate toward them. Comfort zones kill productivity, and they kill sales. Jesus came into our world. Now, if you want to think about leaving a comfort zone, think about that for a minute. Jesus left the worship of angels in the halls of heaven, and he came to this planet to a stall in Bethlehem. And who was here? Sinners, self-righteous, despised, these groups of people who didn't care anything about him. But then his followers impacted the entire known world in one generation because Jesus was willing to call them out of their comfort zones and they followed. This is a word today for those of us who have gotten comfortable. Romans 10, that's where we'll be in your Bible. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to open it to Romans 10. If you're following on a smartphone or tablet, you'll find the digital link at the bottom of the front cover of the bulletin. If you do not have a Bible, do not own a Bible, we want to give you a Bible. First of all, you'll find the text inside your notes page, so you can open that up and follow along. But if you don't own a Bible, we want to give you one as a gift from Faith Baptist Church to you. So I want to encourage you to see me after the service. I would love to be able to give you a copy of God's Word. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 13, one of the most famous passages for Christians regarding salvation, and we generally read verse 13, and oftentimes we will stop with verse 13, but let's continue forward today. Romans 10, 13, the Bible says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then Paul follows through in his argument, and he says, But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Penetrating questions from the Apostle Paul today. And we'll unpack them in just a moment. But now that God has spoken to us through the reading of his word, let's speak with him in prayer. Father, thank you for our time today. Thank you for the opportunity already to reflect what you have done in our lives. Thank you for your table, which reminds us of your sacrifice and your love and your moving out of your comfort zone. And now, Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts 
as we seek to move out of ours. In Jesus' name, amen. You have some points on the right-hand side of your notes page that are going to be a guide for what we're going through today. And so I want to go right into that first point, which gives us something of, I guess you'd say, a theology of how you present the gospel, or really the underpinnings of why you present the gospel to somebody. And the first thing I want you to see is that we have good news for everyone that can save anyone. The Bible says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a remarkable, unbelievable promise from God that anybody, you can walk out of Faith Baptist Church and you can go anywhere in Rowan County. I don't care if it's the biggest, what we would classify, sinner that you can think of in Rowan County. You can walk up to anybody in Rowan County and say, you can be saved with certainty. Here in Romans 10, the everyone or the whosoever that we see is the same that we see in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It is the personalization of the Great Commission that Jesus gave to all of his followers. It is the individualizing of our mission. Anybody can be saved because we have a message that genuinely expresses good news for everybody. No exceptions. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, the entire text of your Bible, as you search the scripture, you find that the heart and the passion of God is for that phrase, all the world that you find in the Great Commission, where it says, go into all the world. Pante ta ethne is the Greek word. Every single ethnic group for every people group of the world to hear the gospel and for everybody to have the opportunity to come to faith and trust in Christ. We know that's actually going to happen. We know the whole world's going to hear the gospel because we read about its fulfillment in the book of the Revelation. But how soon it happens largely depends on you and me. That is a remarkable promise that God gives through the pen of the Apostle Paul. Anybody can be saved from his sins or her sins. Anybody can call on Jesus Christ and receive salvation. It doesn't matter whether that person's Asian or Indian or Chinese or American. We speak in terms that are generically racial or, or national, but God knows every single tribe and tongue and every person individually and even people that we have not identified as different people groups yet. He even knows about those and the promise of the word of God is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But locked in that promise is the reality that they have to call on Jesus. Acts 4.12 says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. All roads do not lead to heaven. It's like my telephone number. If you want to call my house, you can't just call any random series of 10 digits and try and get my house. There is only one number that you can call that is going to get the Barnett household. And there is only one way to get to heaven, and it's through Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty used to driving with a GPS, a global positioning system. How many of you have one of those in your car? Raise your hand. A whole lot of you. All right. You get lost a lot like I do, apparently. You go down the highway with that GPS system, and it gives you turn-by-turn -turn directions. It tells you to turn two miles ahead or however far ahead. It's interesting. When we are driving in America, the roads are very nice and neat and laid out. But I remember hearing about a missionary in Africa who was giving a description of what the roads are like there. You can be riding along, he says, and then suddenly there is a fork in the road. Now that fork in the road might just be a new road that they've cut out to take them around a, a series of ponds or something like that or potholes in this road. Or it might be a totally different road. And you don't actually know until you've been on it for a while. Sometimes it's just a little detour. Sometimes it's a whole separate road. If you make the wrong choice, you end up lost in a totally different village. 
Folks, we are in a world where in people's minds there are a lot of different roads to try and find God. The road of self-help, the road of all the world religions. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am the only road that is going to lead people to God. So it is important that we recognize and truly appreciate that anybody can be saved through Christ alone. Scripture says in order for anybody to be saved, they need to call on the name of the Lord. So we have good news that God intends everybody to hear so that many, many more anyone's can be saved. We have good news for everyone that can save anyone. But the second thing I want you to see, it's not really good news for anyone until we tell someone. Paul goes on to say, but how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? It is almost inconceivable to think that 2,000 years after this time, there are still people groups who have never heard the story of Jesus. But conservative estimates tell us that six billion with a B people in our world are lost without Jesus. And one third of those people have very, very little access or no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are some estimates that say more than 1.5 billion with a B people don't even have access to somebody who can tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. The nature of news by its very definition, is that it has to be shared with somebody in order to be news. Other than that, it's just information. It's just data. If it's not shared with somebody, the facts may all be true, but it's not news until it gets shared. In a world buried in bad news, it desperately needs to hear the good news, and good news isn't good news until it is shared in a way people can understand it. God asked a very practical question through the Apostle Paul here. Anybody can call on the name of the Lord. Anybody according to that promise. But how are they going to do that if they've never heard that God loves them and made provision for their sin and that he, died on the, that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and that by turning from their sin and turning from themselves and trusting Jesus alone that he will save them god says to us to you and to me in this text be realistic how in the world can anybody know the good news unless somebody tells them those of us who have already enjoyed the privilege of having heard the good news it is our job to go out and to tell as many anyone's as we can find or they will continue to die without ever hearing that there is good news that can save them. And folks, lest you believe, wow, we live in the Bible Belt, we live in North Carolina, we live in Rowan County, everybody here knows the gospel, and I will grant you that a lot more people know the gospel here than say would know it in some other places in the world, but there are still people growing up in this culture, going to school with our kids, going to the store with you every day and coming to work who do not know in its fullness the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really seems so simple. And even though Coca-Cola and even though cell phone companies have penetrated the entire world, the gospel still lags a little bit behind. Just in North America... Stop and think about this for a minute. In North America, it is estimated that two-thirds of America's population, that's the United States, 224 million people, do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Two-thirds. Almost 60% of North America lives in its 50 largest cities. One out of every 10 U.S. residents, 11.2% of our population, was born somewhere other than the United States. Of children in the United States under 18, 
40% of them are now non-Anglo. Think about Canada. We haven't even talked about Canada. There are 31 cities in Canada that have 10,000 or more people, and they have exactly zero evangelical churches in them. I didn't say Baptist or Southern Baptist. I said evangelical. They have no presence that shares the gospel whatsoever. It is not really good news for anyone unless we tell someone. And like I talked about last week, God does not have a plan B. He said, you will be my witnesses. So either you will be the witness or there will be no witness. It's not really good news for anyone until we tell someone. Third thing I want you to see today. Someone needs to share the good news with everyone. And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Now, maybe you're sitting there saying, well, preacher, that's the preacher's job. So, preacher, that's your job up there. You go do your job. Let's look at Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. It says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you, talking to everybody following him, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We might excuse ourselves from involvement in the full-time mission field by saying, well, you know what? God hasn't called me to be a missionary as my life's vocation. We might be able to excuse ourselves by saying, ah, you know what? I'm not gifted to be an evangelist the way so-and-so is. But we cannot excuse ourselves from the inclusiveness of Acts 1.8 when he says, you will be my witnesses. Every single person who has the Holy Spirit resident in your life, which is every believer in Jesus, you will be my witnesses. It's not Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. It's actually all inclusive of them at the same time. God has called us to witness in all of those areas. Now the text here says, how can they hear without a preacher? I don't think that's talking about a full-time vocational pastor. It comes from a Greek word. The Greek word is the word caruso. And it simply means someone who announces or someone who proclaims. There are a lot of different ways to announce and to proclaim. You can announce and proclaim in a conversation over coffee at Starbucks. You can announce and proclaim in the checkout line at Walmart. You can announce and proclaim across the fence while you're talking to your neighbor. You can announce and proclaim when you go to a relative's house for lunch this afternoon. Revelation 7 verse 9. Great verse says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language which no one could number standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were robed in white. God desires for every single people group on this planet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus entrusted the gospel with every person in this room who knows Jesus as your Savior. Now, you give, and you give generously, and I love the giving that this church does with a heart to reach the nations, with a heart to reach North America, with a heart to reach North Carolina. But do you know what God's plan is? for winning your subdivision to faith in Jesus Christ? God's plan is you. You are the missionary that he has called in your office. You are the missionary he has called in your school. You are the missionary that he has called at your family gathering this Thanksgiving. You're the one. That's why we do 
I4. That's why we look at a relational strategy because it works so much better if you invest in that person's life and you get to know them and you get to find out how they tick and what's going on in their life and their hurts and their pains and their struggles and their joys and their gladness and it makes it so much easier to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ when you know those things. So you invest in someone's life. Who is that one person you're investing in? Find your one. You invite that person to a worship service. That's not the be-all, end-all, but it gets your foot in the door talking about spiritual things. You include that person in what's going on in your Sunday school class or your Bible study fellowship. And then number four, you inquire. You ask that person what's going on in their life in regard to spiritual things. Jesus entrusted each one of us with the marvelous privilege of making his name famous. It is good news that is for everybody. It can actually save anybody. When that whoever calls on the name of the Lord and is saved, then we become one of the anyone who tells somebody else. As each one tells somebody, together we can tell everybody. But I want to leave you with this. This is a quote from a, ma a man named Alan Lewis. He was the founder of a mission organization called Baptist Mid Missions. Alan Lewis said this, The good news of the gospel is only good news if it reaches the lost in time. You say, well, what does that mean, Pastor? This same book where our text was taken today, Romans, you go back to Romans chapter 2, you don't need to turn there, but in Romans 2, there is a verse of Scripture that says, on the day, talking about a day of judgment, Paul says, on the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ through my gospel. So what Paul is saying right there is someone who hears the gospel and rejects it or someone who just doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. The gospel will not be the instrument of their salvation. It will be the instrument of their judgment. The good news of the gospel is only good news if it reaches lost people in time. Who are you seeking to win today? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.